So uh, what, what we want to uh, show today is that uh, Tesla is uh, much more than an electric car company, uh, that we have uh, deep AI activity uh, in uh, hard hardware on the inference level, on the training level, um, and, uh, and basically, we, I, we, I think we're I think arguably the leaders in real world AI as it applies to the real world. Um, and th those of you who have seen the full self-driving uh, beta, I uh, can appreciate the rate at which the Tesla neural net is learning to, to drive. And um, so this is a, a particular application of AI, but I think there's, there's more, there are more applications uh, down the road that will make sense. Okay, hi everyone, um, welcome. Uh, my name is Andre. And um, I, am, uh, I lead the vision team here at Tesla Autopilot, and I'm incredibly excited to be here uh, to kick off this section, giving you a technical deep dive into the Autopilot stack and showing you all the under the hood components that go into making the car drive all by itself. So here I'm showing the video of the raw inputs that come into the stack, and then neural processes that into the vector space. And you are seeing parts of that vector space rendered in the instrument cluster on the car. What I find kind of fascinating about this is that we are effectively building a synthetic animal from the ground up. So the car can be thought of as an animal. It moves around, it senses the environment, and uh, you know, acts autonomously and intelligently. And we are building all of the components from scratch in-house. So we are building, of course, all of the mechanical components of the body, the nervous system, which is all of the electrical components, and for our purposes, the brain of the autopilot, and specifically for this section, the synthetic visual cortex. So here are some of the results. So on the left, we are seeing what we had before, and on the right, we're now seeing significantly improved predictions coming directly out of the neural net. This is a multi-camera network predicting directly in vector space, and you can see that it's basically night and day. <laughs> now, in the beginning, roughly three or four years ago, most of our labeling was in image space, and so you can imagine that this is taking quite some time to annotate an image like this, and this is what it looked like, uh, where we are sort of drawing polygons and polylines on top of um, on top of these single individual images. As I mentioned, we need millions of vector space labels, so this is not going to cut it. So very quickly, we graduated to three-dimensional or four-dimensional labeling, where we are directly labeling in vector space, not in individual images. So here what I'm showing is a clip, but even this, we realized, was actually not going to cut it, because people and computers have different pros and cons. So people are extremely good at things like semantics, but computers are very good at geometry, reconstruction, triangulation, tracking. And so really for us, it's much more becoming a story of how do humans and computers collaborate to actually create these vector space data sets. So even though we have lots of human laborers, the amount of training that are needed for training the network significantly outnumbers them. So we try to invest in a massive auto-labeling pipeline. Here's an example of how we label a single clip. A clip is an entity that has dense sensor data, like videos, IMU data, GPS, odometry, et cetera. Uh, this can be 45 seconds to a minute long. These can be uploaded by our own engineering cars or from customer cars. We collect these clips and then send them to um, our servers where we run a lot of neural networks offline to produce intermediate results, like segmentation mask, depth, uh, point matching, etc. This then goes through a lot of robotics and AI algorithms to produce a final set of labels that can be used to train the networks. So a single car driving through some location can sweep out some patch around the trajectory using this technique but we don't have to stop there. So here, we collect, collected different clips uh, from the same location, from different cars maybe, uh, and each of them sweeps out some part of their road. Cool thing is we can bring them all together into a single giant optimization. So here, these 16 different trips are organized uh, using, uh, aligned using various features such as road edges, lane lines, all of them should agree with each other and also agree with all of their image space observations. Together, this, is, this produces an effective way to label the road surface, not just where the car drove, but also in other locations that it hasn't driven yet. Combining everything together, we can produce these amazing data sets that annotate um, all of the road texture, all of the static objects, and all of the moving objects, even through occlusions, producing excellent kinematic uh, labels. All, you can see how the cars turn smoothly, produce uh, really smooth labels, all the pedestrians are consistently tracked, uh, the park cars, uh, have basically zero velocity, so we can also know that they are parked. So this is huge for us. Um, in the early days of the network, we noticed, for example, in low visibility conditions, uh, the network can suffer uh, understandably, because obviously this truck just dumped a bunch of snow on us, and it's really hard to see. 
<laughs> and we sent this through our auto labeling pipeline that was able to label 10K clips in within a week. This would have taken several months with humans labeling every single clip here. Um, so we did this for 200 uh, different conditions, and we were able to very quickly create large data sets, and that's how we were able to remove this. So once we train the networks with this data, uh, you can see that it's totally working and keeps the me in memory that this object was there uh, and uh, provides this. And so tonight I'd just like to start by giving you some perspective into the amount of compute that's needed to power this type of data generation factory. We've been scaling our uh, neural network training compute dramatically over the past few years. And today we're barely shy of 10,000 GPUs, which just to give you some sense, in terms of number of GPU, uh, is more than the top five publicly known supercomputers in the world. Um, but that's not enough. There's an insatiable demand for speed as well as capacity for neural network training. And Elon prefetched this, and a few years back, he asked us to design a super fast training computer. And that's how we started Project Dojo. Our goal is to achieve best AI training performance and support all these larger, more complex models that Andre's team is uh, dreaming of and be power efficient and cost effective at the same time. This was entirely designed by Tesla team internally, all the way from the architecture to GDS out and package. This chip is like a GPU level compute with a CPU level flexibility and twice the network chip level IO bandwidth. If I were to plot the IO bandwidth on the vertical scale versus teraflops of compute that is available in the state of the art machine learning chips are there, uh, including some of the startups, you can easily see why our design point excels beyond par. Next up, how to form a compute cluster out of it. By now you must have realized our modularity story is pretty strong. We just put together some tiles. We just tile together tiles. <laughs> a two by three tile in a tray makes our training matrix, and two trays in a cabinet give 100 petaflops of compute. Did we stop here? No. <laughs> we just integrated seamlessly. We broke the cabinet walls. We integrated these tiles seamlessly all the way through, preserving the bandwidth. There is no bandwidth divot out here. There is no bandwidth cliffs. All the tiles are seamlessly connected with the same bandwidth. And with this, we have an exapod. This is one exaflop of compute in 10 cabinets. It's more than a million training nodes that you saw. We paid meticulous attention to that training node, and there are one million nodes out here with uniform bandwidth. To sum it all, this is what it will be. It will be a fastest AI training computer, 4x the performance at the same cost, 1.3x better performance per watt, that is energy saving, and 5x smaller footprint. This will be Dojo Computer. Dojo is real, uh, the Tesla bot will be real. Um, but uh, basically, if you think about what we're doing right now with the cars, uh, Tesla is arguably the world's biggest robotics company because our cars are like se semi-sentient robots on wheels. Um, and with uh, uh, the full self-driving computer, essentially the, the inference engine on the car, which will keep evolving obviously, and uh, Dojo, uh, and all the uh, neural nets, recognizing the world, understanding how to navigate through the world, uh, it, it kind of makes sense to put that onto a humanoid form. Um, 
They're also quite good at uh, sensors and batteries and uh, actuators. So uh, we think we'll probably have uh, a prototype sometime next year uh, that uh, is, basically looks like this and uh, navigate through a world uh, built for humans and uh, eliminate dangerous, repetitive, and boring tasks. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's uh, around, around uh, five foot eight. Um, uh, has sort of a, a screen where the head is for useful information, um, but it's otherwise basically got the autopilot system in it. So it's uh, got cameras, got eight cameras, and full self driving computer, and making use of all of the same tools that we use in the car. So, um, I mean, things that I think that are really hard about. Uh, having a useful humanoid robot is can it navigate through the world without being expl explicitly trained? Uh, I mean, can, without explicit like uh, line by line instructions. Um, can you can you talk to it and say you know please uh, pick up that bolt uh, and uh, attach it to the car with that wrench, and it should be able to do that. Um, it should be able to you know please you know please go to the store and get me the following groceries. Essentially, in the future, uh, physical work will be a choice. If you, if you want to do it, you can, but you won't need to do it. And um, yeah, I think it obviously has profound implications for the economy because uh, given that the economy at, at its foundational level uh, is labor, I mean, capital is, uh, capital equipment is just distilled labor, uh, then um, is there any actual limit to the economy? Uh, maybe not. <laughs>